invite uh, our keynote speaker dr bhaskar chatty ji uh, to launch the two reports uh, for us uh, dr bhaskar chatty ji is the director general and ceo of the indian institute of corporate affairs dr chatty ji is a widely acclaimed management practitioner theorist and teacher he has written and lectured over many years on issues of social and sustainable development corporate responsibility and human resources as secretary to the government of india in the department of public enterprises he prepared and wrote the first comprehensive guidelines on csr for the public sector he joined the indian administrative services in 1975 and has held many distinguished positions in 2008-9 he was the principal advisor in the planning commission he he has been deeply involved with a number of micro and macro economic measures he was also a part of the team responsible for shaping india's response to the global economic crisis of 2009 Dr Bhaskar Chatterjee I would re request you to kindly come on the dais for the launch of the report uh, I would also request uh, Rashmi Singh and Nilesh Kumar to join uh, for the launch of the reports thank you uh, this is the primer that we are launching and we have uh, the csr report as well so thank you everyone thank you everyone thank you uh, dr chaddi ji may i now request you to kindly deliver the keynote address Ms. Jatender Peters, representatives of CARE, lots of ladies, very few gentlemen, uh, <laughs> delegates. Uh, most welcome to this particular meet this morning. It has given me immense pleasure not only to be here amongst you today. Uh, but also to listen to these uh, three very important presentations that were made this morning and each one of them i think focused on some very very important issues and areas women's empowerment is such a large field that it's hard to address it in a in a short period of time that one gets to speak from a platform such as this Uh, it is also diverse in many many senses because it is culture specific nation specific region specific and it has many many connotations more than any one of us can possibly imagine maybe perhaps we could narrow that scope down to a few things that at least the corporate world and our immediate indian environment could come to grips with If you look at a corporation as an organic entity, a company, to me there are two or three things that are important to give women space and create that enabling atmosphere that allows women to come on board and actually show the metal that they have. First and foremost, the leadership of that company. What kind of a culture 
does that leadership create in that company? Is it women friendly? Does it create the kind of atmosphere when women can participate freely, actively, without fear or favor? If that fundamental ground rule, the platform is established, then women get an opportunity to show what they can do. Number two are, of course, the HR principles. The way that the HR rules, objectives are framed. And those like Ms. Peters and myself who come from an HR background know how important that is. So within the company, what are the HR policies that give a lot of recognition, a lot of ability, a lot of scope for encouraging women to come on board? And finally, this is the, the space uh, that Ms. Peters dwelt with mostly, is corporate social responsibility. How does a company use that leverage to bring forward women's empowerment outside the company in the general community? So there are all of these things, leadership, the internal HR, and the external CSR. And if we can bring synergy between all of these three, I believe that there is a huge opportunity for allowing women to show their talent, showcase their talent, and contribute not just to themselves, or just for women, or just for the girl child, or just for the company, but for the nation, in fact, for the globe. And that's where I want women to think out of the box themselves and to step up to the plate. Both Shalini and Ms. Peters also brought into focus the fact that whereas the gender issue is important and we need to encourage women's participation, gender should not become an excuse for non-performance. Women must not use gender to back away from going forward. They must use gender as their strength to accept the challenges because they have so much more to offer. And it is for that reason that you must not compromise with performance to step away from challenges because they take you out or elsewhere. There are issues of security at times and of course one understands that. But when there are security issues are tackled and you have the ability to showcase something then come forward and participate. A lot of the times, the reluctance of women to come forward is itself a problem. So, because companies are now creating opportunities where women feel that they can really do, I think over the last 20, 25 years, we've come a long, long way. And I do feel that rather than lament that even today we are not there, tomorrow whether we will be there, God knows. See the space we have traversed. If you look at the career of Mrs. Peters, you will realize that in the public sector as a woman, how often in an audience like this, she would be the one woman, nobody else. And yet she survived that and went to the top. That took guts and determination. She never made a single excuse that I am a woman, sorry, I can't come, I can't do, late hours, not for me, I won't step up to the challenge, I can't go on tour, none of that. In every single government office, what do you see? 4.30, it becomes a male domain, 4.30 p.m. onwards. There are no women anywhere in any government office, except the secretary or the joint secretary, there are no women around. They've all left at 4.30 maybe five at best. Why? Everybody has commitments, you have your families, but you also need to be able to understand that when work demands, you have to step up to the plate. And therefore, my suggestion to all of you is this, when you have opportunities, grasp them. In performance, and because of performance, merit will triumph. You have that merit locked inside you. Show it. Flaunt your talent. 
That's why God has given it to you. And allow the world to recognize that fact. Given that situation, let's look at the externality. When I was writing the CSR guidelines alone, just one individual, night after night after night, those were the first guidelines that the world ever produced on CSR. 1st of April 2010. And when I was looking at those CSR guidelines, I said, look, here is an opportunity for trying to reach out to the poorest woman in the remotest sections of this country. Shalini spoke about a place close to Nagpur. And where did she go? There. When did she go? A few days ago. Where did I go in the year 1976? as a probationer in Koraput district of Orissa. I trekked 13 kilometers vertically to the Bonda Hills where the world's most extinct tribe lives on the verge of extinction and we were trying to sh make sure that they didn't. Who went with me? I told my wife, stay back. This is something where we have to cut the forest to make our path to get there high on the hilltop. And she said, I didn't marry you to stay at home. I will step with you all those kilometers and get there and stay the night at the hilltop with the Bonda community. That's the kind of spunk that you need. And she did just that. That's the kind of potential that you have and demonstrate it. So when I went there, were there lights? Were there lanterns? Were there anything? Not at all. These are modern devices. How are we trying to empower Bonda women there who didn't wear any clothes? They only had a small little strip in the nether region. Finished. That's it. Within two, two and a half years, the Bonda Development Authority was able to bring 50% of their women below the age of 25 educated in a nearby school which we opened very close to the hilltop. We recruited one teacher who agreed to go there every day, just one. Drops make the ocean. Things don't happen overnight. And I know that gender empowerment, gender equity will take time. But I want to say that there is no opportunity for despondency. India is a robust country and we are moving forward. And CSR, which was then made a part of the CSR guidelines for the public sector, allowed energy to be released to allow companies to formally put women's empowerment on the CSR agenda. And willy-nilly, I didn't know then that I would move from the private sector, from the public sector into the private sector domain, which I am today. And when we wrote the act and the rules, we ensured that women's empowerment becomes a part of the act, the statute and if you look at Schedule 7, you will see that number 3 specifies women's empowerment. So when you are conscious of something you need to do beyond the call of duty, you do it because you believe in it. Look at what CSR throws up for you. It's not just about a CSR department in a company. How many NGOs are there in India? You'll be shocked to know. 3.3 million. 33 lakhs. How many companies will come under the impact of the CSR? 16 and a half thousand companies. How much money will private companies unleash annually in the CSR area? 22 thousand crores. Now we have a slice of pie 
and we have opportunities for boardrooms to push their agenda and in the NGO domain there are loads and loads of women because in an informal sector women get a chance to show their merit even more and so here we have spaces not only for programs meant for women but the delivery mechanism the NGO itself has so many women in the NGO sphere so we have made the pie larger not just give a little more of the existing space to women but cre make the pie itself larger so that women get even more space and inherently that's the way to go so when we now go to corporates when we now talk to companies even if they have 20 projects there are a number of them where there is space to do specific projects for women it's because of these things that I believe that India today is poised despite all the negatives that we hear and with all due respect to the media fair enough they highlight so much of what is saleable but there's a quiet revolution a quiet revolution under the surface where women are emerging and families where you allow your daughters equal opportunities if my son goes to DPS of course my daughter has been there even before every educational opportunity both my daughters are MBAs my son is yet to become one the first and foremost thing is equal opportunity equal schooling equal college then why do you need quotas why do you need reservation what for if you are equally educated you have the skills you perform we give you opportunities for motherhood which men don't go through we provide for that we give you whatever you need to tide you through the time of motherhood but why need you ask for more you have education you have background showcase your talent and now more and more companies are allowing you to do that that's why I believe that people's mindsets are changing the male mindset is also rapidly changing but so must the women's mindset it can't be just one kind of gender helping only itself we have to combine the synergy between the two sexes brings real results for the globe that's why we want diversity because two is better than one any day and because God has created a natural system when the male and the female complement each other they synergize that's why we have marriages because in the union of the male and the female comes the best performance of the human being and to me the organism of the corporate space is just an enlargement of the family if you can see it in that perspective you will see how much we will gain by allowing our women to come forward work in the domain side by side shoulder to shoulder that's my request and that is my appeal to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, we, we have time to take uh, one or two questions from the audience. Uh, uh, it could be for Dr. Chatterjee, uh, for Ms. Peters and Rashmi. Sorry, uh, Rashmi had to leave. So. Uh, just raise your hand if uh, there are any questions uh, in the audience. Okay. No questions? Okay, there's one at the back there. Hi, this is Ritika. Um, my question is actually based on Jatinder Peter's presentation. 
Um, you'd mentioned a lot about how to uh, measure the impact of CSR activities and its outcome. Um, I would want you to maybe elaborate a little more on how can an organization measure the impact of CSR activities because that's something which is, uh, you know, not really as objective as other measurable uh, activities would be. See, actually, I said that that was one of the grey areas. That was one of the challenges being faced by the corporate sector measuring the uh, impact of CSR. See, in the infrastructure projects and uh, um, uh, such projects, it is easy. You know, you have to make a building for a school, you make a building for the school, it is there and it's done. But when you say that uh, empowerment, women empowerment, in the social sector especially, it is very, very difficult to measure the impact. Uh, when you say that uh, women empowerment, how do we gauge that these, this set of women have become empowered? So that is one of the challenges, I said. And, uh, but I think we are working on uh, some of the instruments um, through care. And uh, we are going to, uh, in our further uh, study, we're going to bring that. In fact, that is one of our objectives, to bring it to the corporate world or, or others to measure the impact. We're working on it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? My name is Rar. Yeah. He could just uh, add on to that. See, uh, measuring impact is, in fact, the essence of CSR. If we don't measure impact, we will not go or we will not be able to assess where we are going, right? Did you ask the question, ma'am? Yeah. All right. If you want to measure the impact of anything that you do, there are two or three things you need to keep in mind. One. Where were you before you started? So the first aspect is baseline survey. Now in the CSR guidelines which we're giving out and we're asking companies to do, do not start any project if you have not done a baseline survey. Because you need to know where you're at three years down the line where you are at then. Okay, that's point one. Point two. What are the objectives of your project? Quantifiable and measurable needs to be set out at the start of the project. If your objectives are not clear, you cannot have any assessment. I will, in these 20 villages, ensure that every girl, and there are exactly 1,000 girls today, will go to school at the end of this project. Right now, of these 1,000 girls, only 840 go. Now, you can determine that. As a result of your project, you will do this. In these 20 villages, 67 people are illiterate. At the end of my project, everyone over the age of 21, male or female, will be literate. Taking an education program. So when you literally quantify your objectives in very clear terms, now you go in as an assessor, as an independent assessor. It's easy for you now to measure against the objectives of that project and against the baseline survey which was done. So to get good impact assessment done, we also need well-formulated projects. Why have we said in CSR that one-off intermittent activity will not count as CSR? Donations, distribution of free bees, zilch, no CSR there. You must formulate a project or a program, not an activity. A I camp here, ambulance sending there, none of these is going to count as CSR. If you have a health project, you have to say that my survey reveals that in these 30 villages, the malnutrition among women is so much percent. At the end of my project, a doctoral survey will show that I have brought down malnutrition among women by so much percent. That's my project. And which is why we are encouraging in our whole CSR space 
the formulation of projects and programs with specific objectives. And we are saying to all the corporates, at least 10% of your projects, please get them externally evaluated. What do people do? I did this and I did that, I went to the sun, I went to the moon. Who's interested in your stories except yourself? And a self-certificate is worse than none at all. You can just throw it up and chuck it in the bin. I am saying I did 20 great projects. Who believes you? Go to hell. We've said at least 10% you do 20 projects, get at least two projects externally evaluated by the National Institute of Rural Development, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And we are going to empanel a large number of agencies who are experts in social impact assessment. SIA is now a well-known field in social evaluation. And we are encouraging that very much today. Thank you. We'll be able to take just one last question now before we break. Uh, my question is uh, for Dr. Bhaskar, Bhaskar Chatterjee uh, regarding the company provisions of uh, Schedule 7 of Companies Act. As you said, ki SIE and NAS are very necessary, but uh, as per DP guidelines, they were covered, but not covered in Companies Act. Any of the items in Schedule 7 is not covering the surveys. So I would like a comment on this. No, 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 no. Schedule 7 is not a rule. Schedule 7 only gives you 10 areas in which you may... Who asked the question? Yeah. yeah, good. At least you're well informed about the rules. Yes. Schedule 7 is only a list of areas or sectors in which you can take up your activity. The rules are silent on assessment. They're also silent on doing the baseline survey. So we are hoping now that we are going to issue a set of best practices, guidelines, circulars, which will buttress the rules. Because for everything to make a rule becomes like what? As bureaucratic as you can get. And people will say, Chatterjee was a lifelong bureaucrat, so he's made a whole lot of rules. So I tend to shy away from making too many rules. But gradually, we will appeal to corporates and through our circulars and guidelines, We'll try to ensure that these things actually happen. But a very good point but there. As far as PSUs are concerned, because we bind to the rules. Please understand, in the PSUs, your guidelines expire on what day? Uh, after the your existing PSU guidelines on CSR expire on what day? When the Give me the date. No, 15 days before that. 31st of March, 2014, the DP guidelines expire. And from the 1st of April, 2014, yeah, it's, it's a new regime. Mm -hmm. Only the act and rules expire. The DP secretary said this before the parliamentary committee two days ago. So now, forget that. It's only about the act and the rules, and as I said, the circulars and guidelines which we'll issue on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, due, to, due to paucity of time, if uh, I would request uh, participants to discuss those questions over the tea break that we are going to have now. Uh, I, I would like to once again thank uh, Dr. Chatterjee to spare his uh, valuable time uh, today. And today he has his uh, board meeting and it was really fortunate uh, for all of us to have him here and hear him speak on this uh, important issue. I would uh, once again uh, request all of you to join for a tea break now and we'll be back in another uh, 10 minutes. Thank you everyone. <laughs>